I arrived at this via Chartism, which I arrived at via some broader work I'd done on reform movements in the 19th century. And the more I sort of studied Chartism in Nottinghamshire, which is the, the area that interested me, the more I got into the framework knitters. And of course, you can't really write about the history of the framework knitters in the 30s and 40s, which is the time of Chartism, of course, without understanding something of that rich history. An important episode of which, of course, it's not the only one, but the one we're going to talk about today is the Luddism of the framework knitters. Now, as we heard, actually, there's been quite a lot of stuff been going on over this last couple of years and probably for a bit longer about Luddism, but a lot of it has actually been about different groups of workers, groups of workers who weren't actually the original Luddites. The original Luddites came from round here. But, of course, the movement famously spreads to the West Riding, to the croppers, and some would say also in Lancashire as well. Now, we've heard a lot about that, but I think there's been less said recently and historically about Luddism in Nottinghamshire. So that, that's the kind of point where I arrived at, and as I'm sure I don't need to tell this group, it's been a topic that's generated a lot of historical debate. It, it obviously was a, an important movement at the time. It really unnerved the local establishment and also, of course, the government as well. But since then, and famously with E.P. Thompson, who I see on the bookshelf there, 1963, ever since then, it's been a really controversial movement. For Thompson and those who followed him, Luddism was uh, the rational response of a class-conscious working class to capitalist exploitation. And he saw it, of course, as a reaction to the passing away of a moral economy. The idea seems alien, of course, to, to people nowadays that economies should be conducted, not necessarily just on the basis of the free market, that it's important to ensure goods are produced under conditions that are fair and that people receive a just wage. Thompson saw Luddism as a reaction to the passing away of what he called the moral economy and its replacement by what we would call these days free market economics. The most controversial thing about Thompson's argument was that Luddism then represented the kind of dawning of, of working class consciousness, the idea that workers, not just in the framework knitting industry, but as it spread to the other textile areas, that this signified a uh, growing consciousness that they had more in common with these workers elsewhere than they did with uh, those who employed them um, in the local environment. That was controversial. Even more controversial, of course, was Thompson's argument that Luddism and a number of other episodes, going all the way up to those Reform Bill rights we heard about and beyond, brought Britain very close to revolution of a class-conscious kind. Then the only, I think, really significant piece of work that was done on Nottinghamshire Luddism after Thompson was a book by Malcolm Thomas published in 1970 called The Luddites. That, of course, was, again, was looking at Luddhism in three regions, but he had some important things to say, I think, about Luddhism here. My problem with that book is that he was so concerned to attack Thompson, to demolish a lot of those arguments that Luddhism somehow represented um, the flowering of working-class consciousness, that Britain was close to revolution, that having finished that book, I find it very difficult to understand what Luddhism is. He's very good at telling us about what Luddhism isn't, but it doesn't really leave you with a sense of what is this movement. And it seems to me, at least, and I, I hope to persuade you this afternoon, that really to make sense of Luddism, I think we need to begin somewhere else, which is not, was Luddism a harbinger of Marxist revolutionary class consciousness? Um, I'm not saying that it necessarily wasn't those things, but I am saying to interpret it just in that framework is to interpret Luddism in the light of events that happened later on and it isn't necessarily to see Luddhism on its own terms. So I want to suggest an alternative way of thinking about Luddhism. The essence of that I'm going to introduce to you by a letter that was sent to the Home Office, written by Thomas Boozy, who is a name some of you may know. If you played musical instruments, he was soon to be immortalised as the founder of Boozy and Hawks. But here he is sending a letter to the Home Office, to the Home Secretary, in January 1812, from a letter that he'd actually received from a friend who remained nameless, for fear of their letter falling into wrong hands. Their letters have been opened 
um, and intercepted by this stage. The reason why Boozy passes this letter on to the Home Office is that it's written by someone who he sees it has a very good understanding of what's going on in and around Nottingham to do with the frame breaking that had broken out in the year before. The contents of this unsigned letter, then, are quite revealing. Boozy's friend emphasised the frustration and helplessness of the local elite who were responsible for trying to restore order. One of the things the Luddites uh, had done very effectively was to render the areas around Nottingham virtually ungovernable, so much so that the, the very meagre local forces of law and order, and bearing in mind we are talking about the time where each parish has a constable in the singular, and if necessary, of course, against the background of uh, the French Revolution, the Lord Lieutenant, Duke of Newcastle, can embody the militia and call out the omenry. But these are volunteer forces. They're relatively new, certainly in one case, and their reliance is thought to be questionable. So not surprising, when these waves of frame-breaking keep happening and keep happening, the local elites headed by Newcastle are writing to the Home Office saying you need to send troops to Nottinghamshire to restore order. And it's worth remembering, actually, that a larger force, military force, is sent to Nottinghamshire, uh, a larger force than has ever before been necessary to quell a local disturbance. And famously, of course, by the time Luddism has spread to the north into Lancashire and the West Riding, there are more troops in the north of England than Wellington took with him to wage the Peninsular Wars uh, a few years before. So this gives you just an indication of how worried and alarmed the local elite are at this time. Anyway, what are the specifics of what Boozy says to the Home Office? It's very exercised by what he concerns to be the frustrations and helplessness of the local elite, who in his view are simply powerless to prevent the guerrilla warfare tactics of the Luddites. And I'll talk to you more about what a Luddite raid actually involved shortly. Nowhere was this powerlessness symbolised more than in the figure of the lonely magistrate, who of course was charged with keeping the peace in the village, the villages around Nottingham, and there's a, a separate set of magistrates who are responsible for keeping order in Nottingham as well. As I'm sure you all know, it was actually in the villages around Nottingham rather than in Nottingham itself, that Luddism first began, and was a much more violent affair, I would suggest, in the villages than perhaps Thomas and even Thompson uh, was, was willing to admit. Far removed from the, the protection of the concentrated forces of law and order in Nottingham itself, the lonely uh, hosiers and master knitters of the villages found themselves victim to some of the most daring and violent Luddite attacks. In the absence of an adequate military force, the position of the county magistrates, a number of whom live very close to the Luddites, such as Lord Middleton at Woolerton and Lancelot Rolleston at Watnall, it was virtually impossible for them to preserve order. Shortly after the Framebreakers had renewed their campaign at the end of November 1811, one of the Bow Street officers, again this is an indication of just how worried the national elite are, they've actually sent up police from London to Nottingham, one of the Bow Street officers sent up was complaining of just how useless the county magistrates were. It was, uh, a number of them, particularly Nottingham itself, are complaining that the magistrates in these villages aren't doing more. Now, I've already suggested to you why they weren't doing more, because they live in the middle of these Luddite districts. I think also, I haven't got any direct evidence of this just yet, that those county magistrates are people who privately, were probably quite sympathetic to some of the objectives of the Luddites, if not necessarily their methods, and had traditionally played a part in regulating wages, ensuring adequate food supplies, those sorts of things. So it's not a coincidence, I think, that they're slower to, to mobilise themselves than their brethren in Nottingham. Anyway, Boozy's friend had an acute appreciation of the position these county JPs found themselves in, and I quote him here, should the county magistrates exert themselves, then it becomes obvious that it must be at the evident hazard of their property. Cutting up plantations, burning hay and corn stacks, hoeing cattle and horses, cutting their hoods off, would be the prelude to more serious depredations. Perhaps unbeknown to Boozy, by the time he wrote this letter, those sorts of depredations were already 
uh, taking place in the villages around Nottingham. The fact that frame breaking in Nottinghamshire was accompanied by numerous instances of rick burning, of stack firing, of plant maiming, of attacks on farms, barns and other rural property serves as a reminder that protest movements like Luddism don't necessarily fall neatly on the urban-rural divide. And it seems to me that Luddism has always traditionally been interpreted as an urban movement that arose out of a tradition of wage disputes within the framework knitting trade. I want to suggest to you that Luddism, certainly in the villages around Nottingham, makes more sense when we interpret it as a rural movement rather than an urban one. This is a map from 1826 of the areas that I'm going to be talking about, and uh, a number of you will know this, of course. The epicentres of Luddism are in Baseford, in Bulwell, and Hucknall Torkard, and, of course, the other one I've forgotten, Arnold. Bear in mind, this is a short period of time after Luddism, and you can see straight away, just by looking at these maps, that you are still talking about places that were villages and, in the larger cases, were slowly in the process, of course, of becoming towns. But they are, first and foremost, villages. Just let me say something about evidence to illustrate that it's these villages that are the epicentres of Luddism. These are places with five or more separate reported incidents of frame-breaking in that first phase of Luddism, and you can see here it's topped by Baseford, followed by Nottingham, Bulwell, Arnold and Radford. Now, it should be pointed out, though, that there were many other instances where frames were broken, just not as many, which is why they don't make the sort of league table as it were. With the exception of Mansfield, which was a sizable town by this period, these places were all small villages and small towns dotted around Nottingham. So, from the perspective of counting, actually, Nottingham seems underrepresented. Out of a total of 103 separate incidents of frame breaking, you can see only 12 were actually in Nottingham itself. Now, I talk about episodes of frame breaking rather than counting the individual number of frames that were broken, because that's virtually impossible because of the paucity of the, the archive and the historical record. So these are actually separate instances where frames were broken. It could be that in one of these separate instances, as was common, multiple numbers of frames were broken, often in the same workshop. But going back to the point about most of these places being villages, usually as a rule of thumb, the historical geographers at this time say 2,500 and above is the size of a town. So you can see that some of these places are just coming in there. Arnold, Baseford's a bit under, Bulwell's even less, and Radford just under as well. But whilst Arnold, Baseford and Radford each exceed 2,500, it's worth pointing out that these are actually the parish figures. And as some of you will know with intense local knowledge of these places, these parish figures actually hide smaller villages. The parish of Arnold, for example, in addition to the village of Arnold itself, also included the neighbouring villages of Daybrook and Redhill. And similarly, by 1811, commentators are already distinguishing between new and old Baseford. New Baseford is very much a suburb growing up, an industrial suburb growing up as a result of the expansion of Nottingham. But Old Baseford, uh, separate from that, is still very much a traditional village community. My point here, then, is that the vast majority of Luddites resided in places with populations of less than 2,500, and they broke frames in similar places. We take the places for which exact population figures exist, which is 24 out of the 28 places that witnessed episodes of frame breaking, the population medium is around a thousand. 